Good morning, Africa, and happy Global Meetings Industry Day. I am super excited to anchor this year's um, Global Meetings Industry Day from my home country, uh, Zambia. Today is a very special occasion because it is a realization that has um, taken pretty much most of my career. I will share that story later today. But for this morning, I am very excited because for the first time, we are having an official uh, celebration across Africa that is actually being recognized by the Meetings Min Business Coalition. So Meetings Industry, Global Meetings Industry Day today, the 8th of April, is an event that is um, hosted to remind us of the importance of our industry. The meetings industry was the first to go when COVID struck. We were all faced with so much uncertainty. It's been a year. We're meeting now virtually in what has become the new normal. We are seeing each other more in screens than face to face, something that we did not think was going to happen in. Uh, we were hoping as meeting planners, it would not happen so soon, but we are now working in an environment that is more uh, buttons and curses than it is actually in person. Um, a year into COVID and we are trying to find our balance. Today, I'm very happy and very privileged to anchor an event that is being hosted as um, an activity that the Africa Tourism Association hosts. So the Africa Tourism Association, a member-based organization does host um, a town hall meeting for CEOs that they do periodically over the year. Now this event, they have agreed to partner with us uh, to host this event, which is going to discuss and focus on the meetings industry on mice. And we're going to have a distinguished panel later in the program. We also do have the Africa Union Commission present here with us today that are really going to show us that truly meetings mean business. My name is Mula Mwamongwa. I am your host for today, and I am the co-host of the Africa um, of the Africa Mice Summit. I will share a message that has come in from the Meetings Mean Business Coalition um, that is going to uh, be shared to us from the United States. Universally known as GMIT. May I take this opportunity to recognize the Happy Global Meetings Industry Day, universally known as GMIT. May I take this opportunity to recognize the various organizations that have made today possible. The African Tourism Association, the Africa Mice Summit, Cadozo Consult, Meetings Professionals International, and special recognition to the African Union for being present and resounding that truly meetings means business. To the distinguished panelists, we look forward to learning from you and sharing the possibilities. I'm Nan Marchand Beauvoir, Director of the Meetings Means Business Coalition in the U.S. I would love to take the time to share the history of GMID and why it's more critical now than ever before to elevate the importance of our industry. GMID was created in 2016 to showcase the proven value that business meetings, conference, conventions, incentive, travel, trade shows and exhibitions, the mice business, what the mice business brings to businesses and local economies around the world. Since its inception, GMIT has galvanized partners globally and empowered advocates to communicate our industry's value to lawmakers, the media, and business leaders. Last year brought a new challenge with the international impacts of COVID-19. However, today, we are unapologetic as we come together in all settings, stronger and more united than ever, to celebrate GMIT with the theme, Meet Safe, recognizing the industry's top priority of operating meetings and events with health and safety top of mind. We celebrate GMID this year to securing much needed relief and recovery for our industry. Today, you will all hear from leaders that will further showcase the industry's incredible value across Africa. Building on the African population, we can only implore you all to look within as you find ways to recover the meetings industry. 54 countries is a strong place to start. Thank you, Africa, for being part of the global celebration and your support of the meetings and events industry. Wishing you all a wonderful GMID. Thank you. Thank you very much for that message. Um, we are here today representing the different countries. 
as you are aware, or as some of you experienced, um, when COVID struck, we were found as planners without a voice. The voice was driven more by um, venue owners, hotels, um, leisure operators, business tourism was not a conversation that was front and center in most destinations like my home country, Zambia. Today, I am privileged to welcome to this panel, to this session, um, the, African, uh, com the African Union Commission, Ambassador Albert Muchenga. I am very privileged to welcome him because he's not just from the African Union, but he is Zambian too. So it is double the pride, but also it gives us hope that the business industry, the meetings industry is going to have a voice at the African Union. The African tourism does have um, a partnership with the African Union, and this is how we were able to have them present in our event today. I will now allow the ambassador to address us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mlema. I salute all the chief executives of uh, the tourism industry in Africa, as well as uh, the distinct uh, participants. I'm very happy to be with you on this occasion of the Africa Tourism Association Town Hall. The choice of the theme for this meeting, MITSEF, is very appropriate. In these days of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, SEFT is of paramount importance at the global, regional, national, community, household, and even individual levels. I'm advised that most of you in this town hall meeting are in the meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibition segment of the tourism sector, or MICE. It is popularly known. I will now I will touch on this issue later in my statement. Let me begin by saying that the African Union attaches high priority to tourism as an enabler of economic diversification, employment generation, poverty reduction, and among others, promotion of decent livelihoods. Tourism will now be a larger program in the formed African Union Commission. It has been upgraded to a, vision, a division to be headed by a principal police officer who supervises three other program officers. There used to be one police officer in the old structure. The program activities of the tourism sector at the level of the African Union will be based on the African tourism strategy, which covers the period 2019 to 2028. Through this strategy document, Tourism stakeholders will be requested to identify their roles in its implementation. To facilitate effective coordination with us at the African Union Commission, I will urge the African tourism stakeholders to consider the of African tourism associations and affiliate organizations. Once this board is established, we'll be ready to enter into a memorandum of understanding to establish a legal basis for our engagement. There are examples of other similar initiatives regarding the pharmaceutical industries, cotton and textiles, mining, manufacturing, agro-processing, and chambers of commerce and industry, among other private sector entities that are engaging with us. The African private sector has also created an apex body the African Tourism, the African Business Council, which is the overall coordinator of the African Union engagement with the private sector. As things stand at the moment, the African Union Commission has no formal working relationships with the African Tourism Board, the African Travel Tourism Association, and the African Tourism and, and Travel Association, as well as the non-governmental organizations engaged in the tourism sector across the continent. With this state of affairs, the African Union, the African tourism stakeholders run the risk of being marginalized in our growing engagement with the African private sector. And that should not happen. It is therefore my expectation that my presence at this town hall meeting 
we mark the start of moving towards a formalized framework of engagement I suggested above. You may, in this respect, consider setting up an ad hoc steering committee to initiate consultations with the African Union Commission aimed at formalizing our engagement. We can give you insights on how to establish body across Africa, as well as drafting of a memorandum of understanding. Let me now turn to the issues affecting tourism development across Africa. I'll start by saying that tourism is one of the most important economic sectors in Africa. Statistics from the World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC, show that the sector contributed 8.5 or 194.2 billion US dollars in 2018 to the gross domestic product of the continent. In addition, the African tourism sector employs over 20 million people, accounting for 6.5% of the total workforce across the continent. Women make up nearly 60% of the tourism workforce in Africa. Sadly, however, their contribution is largely in the low status of, uh, and very precarious jobs and poorly paid for that matter. Tourism also contributes significantly to community development and provides, again, many opportunities for self-employment by women, enabling them to generate incomes for the upkeep of their families. In addition to the foregoing, tourism links Africans across borders. In 2013, Zambia and Zimbabwe co-hosted the 20th Assembly, General Assembly of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Beyond meetings, it is very common across Africa to see tourist, these tourist, tourist attractions across borders, escorted by tour guides from neighboring countries. Of course, there have also been instances where tourism offerings in one country are marketed and branded to be an attraction of that marketing country in a bid to maximize earnings. It is also pertinent to point out that as COVID-19 pandemic disrupts the global economy, the tourism sector will be one of the worst hit economic sectors in Africa. In many places, hotels are laying off workers, while travel agencies are also closing down. It is equally pertinent to point out that Africa is at the lower end of the global tourism market. The continent accounts for less than 5% of annual of the annual share of tourism attractions from, other, from all over the world. Part of the problem, or part of the problems are related to physical and non-physical barriers, as well as a high cost of travel, which severely limit access to many African destinations. This reflects the importance of tourism development on The African Union Commission is involved in this direction. Beyond the strategy document referred to earlier, we have launched a number of key continental programs to develop the tourism sector. We have the single African air transport market, which was launched in January 2018, together with a protocol on the free movement of persons, right of residence, and right of establishment. The latter addresses the issues of interest to you, tourism stakeholders, such as visa-free travel, a single African passport, and mutual recognition of professional and academic qualifications. Furthermore, we have the Program for Infrastructure De uh, Development in Africa, or PIDA, which will, among others, contribute to the development of the aviation, railways, road transport, ICT, and energy networks, which are all critical to the development of tourism in Africa and beyond. Let me now turn to issues directly affecting your operations in the tourism industry. As people in the business, I'm sure you are fully aware that in spite of its challenges mentioned earlier, Africa had, according to the United Nations World Tourism Organization, by the start of 2020, the world's second fastest growing tourism industry, with 71.2 million international arrivals in 2019, generating about 40 billion US dollars in revenue. The top slot went to Asia. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 global pandemic 
has adversely affected the sector, as has been mentioned earlier. In spite of this pandemic, I'm advised that the global mice market is forced to grow by $8.4 billion during 2020 to 2024. The investment in mines would mitigate the seasonal nature of the leisure tourism segment. As the global community moves towards a post COVID 19 era, collaboration and partnerships will be strategic levers of gaining competitive advantage. In this respect, I'm hoping to know the association is organizing this event in, a, in a collaboration with the African Mines Summit. I've also gone through the program and noted the list of distinguished speakers that include Meetings Professional International and the African Society of Association Executives. All the, these will, beyond doubt, play a key role in the recovery efforts of the mice sector. I commend you for this collaboration. In today's world of increasing complexity, disruption, and interdependence, collaboration and partnerships are the new competition. At this point, let me state that there is emerging consensus that Africa's tourism strategy should be strategically focused on leveraging intra-African travel and business. The opportunities are offered by the African continental free trade area market, whose start of operation was rolled out on 1st January this year. Through the protocol on trade in services, the tourism sector is among the priorities for liberalization together with the sectors of business services, communication, financial services, and transport in this new continental market with huge gro growth potential. The latest statistics from the African Development Bank place Africa's aggregate growth domestic product to be at the level of 3.2 trillion US dollars. In addition to this, the African continental free trade market has a population of 1.3 billion people projected to rise to 1.7 billion people by 2030. The middle class is estimated at 350 million people and is expected to rise to 650 million people by 2030. In this large and growing market, private and business consumption is also expected to rise to about 6.7 trillion US dollars by 2030. I will end my statement with seven points, very brief one. First, as part of the efforts to open up markets during the COVID-19 period, including those of the tourism sector, we at the African Union Commission are working with the Afro Champions Initiative to come up with a harmonized emergence responses, including harmonized health, safety, and travel protocols that will facilitate safe travel across the continent and beyond. Second, in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic, virtual meetings and exhibitions will continue growing as segments of the global mice industry. It is for that reason that you are simply meeting in the same setting today. You as industry players will need to reflect on how you profit from this new opportunity that challenges the traditional era of in-person mice events. Third, you also have to address the key issue of skills development in the African mice industry. In this respect, you need to work with governments and training institutions across Africa to ensure that your industry has a steady supply of employable people. Fourth, modern and quality hard infrastructure for the mice industry also matters. Convention centers, accommodation, transport, including air connectivity, communication uh, technologies, and health facilities are part of the hard infrastructure menu. Again, you have to work with the governments to facilitate development of the mice infrastructure across Africa. Fifth, branding and marketing African tourism increases its value. That value will be maximized if there is collaboration in branding and marketing Africa's tourism offerings. In this connection, we at the African Union Commission will shortly convene a meeting of national tourism boards or agencies across Africa and associated stakeholders to facilitate harmonized branding and market of Africa's tourism attractions. Sixth, the African Union Commission has since 2018 partners with the African Export Import Bank to organize the Inter-African Trade Fair every two years. The second edition postponed from last year to this year will be held in Kigali 
with 1,000 buyers and sellers, as well as business to business transactions of one over for two billion US dollars. African tourism sectors are encouraged to participate in this fair. Part of the attractions will be the youth startup pavilion. Tourism youth startup entrepreneurs are encouraged to compete for space in that pavilion, which will accommodate 150 young entrepreneurs from Africa and the diaspora. The youth startup operators will also network with the cap venture capital firms in order to assist, assist them raise equity for the growth of their businesses. Seventh and the last, in order to raise the profile of the issue, of the issue in the agenda of the Assembly of the African Union of Health and Debt, our practice is to appoint a leader and a champion at that level. We plan to have a leader and champion on the African Sustainable Tourism Development. The team and I in Asababa who are currently working on the terms of reference for that role. After which, I recommend to the chairperson of the African Union Commission on who among our leaders should be appointed as the champion and leader. As tourism stakeholders, you can also make suggestions on the nominations uh, uh, to my office and of course with appropriate discussion for that nomination. I'll end here and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you so much. We are very honored you have heard that um, we are going to Kigali and I am not sure if I still qualify as a youth, but thank you very much. Now you're able to see my full t-shirt and what it says. So today is about the meetings industry, but for me personally, today is more about the planners, people like me, people whose lives were changed, our revenue streams, our leads, everything changed in a moment. People made decisions, no meetings, and no meetings meant no job. So now I am honored to provide um, a solution that I had found myself that saved me last uh, during uh, this downtime. So as a planner, I, I basically found myself unemployed. I was trying to fit in, to find a purpose, to find what would be the next thing I would do. And I realized that rather than focusing outside my space, I, would, I could do what I knew best. And what I know best is to advocate, to advocate for an industry, because that's what we do when we're managing it. Clients who come from the energy sector, they come with briefs and we set up something for them. And I realized that we didn't have that voice at continental level. So today I am very honored to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Drew Holmgren, who is going to be speaking to us at, I think now is about 3 a.m. his time. He is coming in from the Meetings Professional International. He is going to come because we have advocated. I personally could not find a solution for my specific needs. And in 2019, I had to travel to get my certification in the US. A lot of other people have had to travel to build their own capacity. But today, starting from today, a solution for Africa is born. Drew, are you on? Are you awake? I am awake. I'm I'm good. As I told Mulemwa, I don't uh, I don't drink caffeine, so I'm I actually have got a high on chocolate right now, so I'm okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, first and foremost, uh, yes. Uh, good morning from uh, Dallas, Texas, where it is 3 a.m. here. Uh, I'm I'm so honored to be a part of this program and and just looking at the chat. It's so wonderful to see so many of you um, coming in from all over Africa. I saw Kenya, I saw South Africa, I saw Zambia, Uganda, Ethiopia, Nairobi. That's really exceptional. I even saw a couple of UK and United States. So that, that's really great to see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share here and walk through a few things uh, so you all can uh, learn a little bit about MPI, Meeting Professionals International. <clears throat> So just real briefly, um, you know, it's as part of this program where we're extremely excited. We've been looking to expand uh, MPI's footprint. We are a global organization. I'll go through those details in a second. But 
there's so much opportunity in Africa, which the ambassador just spoke through at length, which was really, really impressive. But with 54 countries, thousands of, of meeting professionals, um, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to provide the resources that we offer so that you can start to come together and unite as an industry and, and unite as a continent um, across all 54 countries. Uh, so I'm gonna go into about MPI here uh, right now. And first I'll show a little video about us. Behind every festival, every speech, every product launch, every special event is a professional, a professional who specializes in bringing people together, a professional who understands business goals and strategy, a professional who can create never before seen experiences that inspire people to evolve their outlooks, examine their preconceptions and take positive action. Meeting Professionals International is the career home for people who bring people together. Through its accredited professional development programs and network of local chapters around the world, MPI educates, supports, and connects the connectors so they can produce events that inspire, energize, and create positive change. Because MPI knows that when we meet face-to-face, -face, we can stand shoulder to shoulder. When we meet, we change the world. So let me get into a little bit of depth there. Um, we've kind of stated throughout, we are a global organization and, and though we, we speak with many voices, this is, this is really the message that we share that our, our vision as an organization is to lead and empower the meeting and event community to change the world. And how we do that is our mission. And that's to connect the global meeting and event community to learn, to advocate, uh, to collaborate and, uh, coll and innovate. Um, we deliver all of this through education and international connections that really work to connect that global membership and empower our community to change the world. And we're committed to really providing these resources to Africa so that we can enable um, the entire uh, continents and all of the countries, professionals ability to grow personally and professionally. And it all starts with our membership. We've got about 13,000 members worldwide spread across 75 countries and that's all localized at the at the chapter level of which we are the largest industry association both in terms of members and in terms of that chapter network with almost 70. Um, our membership base is about split between um, suppliers and planners and then we've also got a, a decent size of students and faculty and uh, kind of writing in line with what the ambassador spoke to moments ago, our membership is primarily female because this industry is dominated by women, which is a great thing. It's a wonderful footprint that we have. Um, kind of looking into the, the, the application of membership and what it means to you, education is, is one of those two really main offerings that we have. And the MPI Academy is kind of our university. Um, we have, we have uh, certification courses that cover everything from the basics all the way to an actual master's program that's facilitated through San Diego State University in the United States. Mulemwa was speaking earlier about education that she took and she came to the United States and took part in a program that was offered up through our partnership with Indiana University. So we've got accredited programs, all of these programs, when I say accredited, they're all actually based on fundamentals provided and um, governed by another group called the Events Industry Council. So it's all reputable education that, uh, that is highly sought after. In terms of our chapter network, we have 67 chapters across the world currently. And this is kind of our footprint that you see. We've, we've got a large footprint in North America, in Europe, and a budding, um, some budding growth in South America and Asia as well. Obviously, our hope is to start to expand our, our, our footprint into Africa. But what, what's really great about the chapter perspective is that it allows us to really localize the, the experience. So it gives us the ability to take that global offering and localize it at the chapter level, which in turn offers individuals within those chapter the opportunity to grow in leadership positions where you can be an executive or a director on the board of your chapter. And you can also start to direct the actual path of the chapter through creation of localized education, peer-to-peer -peer networking, 
and other types of activities. So that's and that's the big thing, you know, that that really allows that local chapter to operate as its own community within the global footprint. And when it comes down to it, that's really what we are trying to do with uh, with the establishment of an African chapter. Um, the the idea here is to really help grow our presence within Africa, provide you all with the resources you need. And it all starts with this club project. Um, we initially will start with a club in Africa as we continue to grow, it can become a chapter. And then as it grows beyond that, we can then expand into regional or even country-based clubs or chapters. It's the exact same model that we've had amazing success with throughout Latin America, where we started with a Mexico chapter and now that's expanded to Colombia, to Brazil. We're now working on Ecuador and continuing to just grow and grow and grow that community. And this, the you know, one of the great benefits when you, when you kind of think of the, the mission that MPI has, that advocacy, right? Again, going right in line with what the ambassador was speaking to, that advocacy is so critical. And it really, it starts at the global level, but it really permeates through to the chapter level because that allows you to, to work on that narrative, to to really expand and, and drive knowledge and awareness about all of the great venues, all of the great travel opportunities, the meeting opportunities available in Africa, and then use our global footprint to get that message out there. A few other things I wanna highlight, um, our, our education and our networking all really come together at our signature events. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our primary North American event here in a second. But we have global events ranging from our World Education Congress to our European Meetings and Events Conference um, on to other events localized at the chapter. We've got a digital series. Sorry, slides keep adjusting themselves. We've got a digital series and then we've got a great partnership with an organization called IMAX. And this is where that, that all of the opportunities really start to run together. And then finally, we have a nonprofit uh, foundation called the MPI Foundation, which offers financial support both to distressed members and to chapters. It's actually over the course of the pandemic since April, it's benefited over 2,500 um, members of MPI, offering them the ability to renew and distributed almost three quarters of a million dollars US in order to provide them with the support that they need. So what does this all mean specific to Africa? Um, working with Mulemo, working with um, the other associations there, we are very, very aggressive and, and almost bullish in our approach to helping grow Africa and the, uh, the, the, the ability for us to provide these resources. So where a typical a membership to MPI US normally costs 375 for a planner, um, we are adjusting our prices and regionally localizing them to be more based on the socioeconomic, socioeconomic status of different countries. And in, that, in this particular case, we're going to offer a 12 month membership for $40 US. Um, all you have to do is visit mpi.org slash join and use the code Africa 2021. As also part of this, because we, we really do wanna help provide all the resources you need to grow. Uh, we're going to offer up two different custom annual uh, webinars to all of our members who come in from Africa. Um, these webinars will be specific to your needs. They'll offer education and networking that immediately benefits you. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. We also are going to offer a custom new member orientation just for Africa members. Uh, a couple of stipulations because <laughs> this is a $40 membership, which is significantly lower than what we typically charge. Um, the, uh, uh, you have to be a resident of an African country in order to take advantage of this benefit. Um, uh, we, we have to accept payment over credit card, which can all be done easily um, over the internet through mpi.org. And when you do join, you'll come to a part in the screen that asks you to choose a chapter. Choose Africa at large as your chapter. That will help us group everybody together so we can start to connect to everybody who joins from this great continent. And if you have any questions at all, feedback at mpi.org. Uh, I've got one of my associates, Christy Estrada, on the line currently. Um, if you've got any questions, any issues in, in uh, becoming a member, please reach out to us. 
And so I'm just going to wrap with a few other comments here. Um, I, again, so thrilled to be a part of this broadcast. Uh, MPI is actually doing its own broadcast that, that starts at the conclusion of this one at uh, 1 p.m. your time, which will be 6 a.m. our time, which I get back online for in just a few hours. You can register still at mpi.org slash GMID. We are going to talk about our Africa push at uh, 1.30 p.m. We'll show a video from Mulemwa and then we're going to have a, a short uh, discussion about our efforts. Uh, but it's a great 12 hour broadcast. It goes from uh, 1 p.m. to 1 a.m. your time if you'd like to stay up. And then I did mention our World Education Congress. This is our big North American event. Um, in a typical non-pandemic year, we have about 20% of the attendees are international and in total we get about 3,000 each year. Uh, this year there is an online component to it, a digital component. Um, it's a fantastic three-day show. If you log on to mpi.org slash WEC Vegas, uh, you can get more information. And uh, we've got a, a promotional rate that runs through the end of the month. And finally, if you have any questions and want to connect with me, um, these are all of my uh, kind of connections through social and email. This is a picture of me before the pandemic when I wasn't forced to shave my head because I wasn't getting a haircut anymore. <laughs> Uh, but truly excited to have uh, to have this opportunity. Special thanks to all of the organizations that are involved in, in uh, GMID today, and certainly a special thanks to Mulemwa for allowing us the time and for championing the opportunity for MPI to grow and provide these great resources to you. So I'll stop my share. And again, uh, I absolutely appreciate the time. Drew, thank you very much for your contribution today. It's much appreciated. Um, I'm Naledi Kabo from the Africa Tourism Association. As the ambassador touched on during his remarks, the importance of collaboration during this period is paramount. So we were very happy to join the Africa Mice Summit and MPI in bringing our CEO town hall to today's session. In partnership with Voyages of Freak, we established the CEO Town Hall to serve as a platform for leaders across the tourism sector to directly address pressing questions and issues put before them by a global audience of industry leaders, meeting and event planners, business owners, and travelers alike. So today we are happy to present this very special MICE edition with leaders from across the supply chain, from associations, event organizer, venue managers, and convention bureau leadership to really explore how we can meet safe as we continue to navigate through COVID. Without further delay, I will turn it over to our town hall moderator, Kojo Benton Williams, publisher and CEO of Voyages at Creek. Hi, Nadine, thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to host this very important uh, meeting. Uh, like she said, uh, we've been having a town hall meeting right from uh, June uh, last year, 2020. And it's a good opportunity for us to be able to discuss and see what we can do to restart uh, mines and I mean restart tourism, but then look at my how what is being done by the players and the you know actors in the industry. So for today's events, um, you know, privileged to be joined by Carl Scofield from the QA Solutions. I have Toby Matabeni from she's the CEO, and then uh, Jacinta Nzioka from the, she's the acting national coordinator for the Kenya National Convention Bureau, and uh, Nick Sabula, he's an MD for African, Aframco, if I'm, if I'm, I mean, if I'm right, Aframco, yes. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you again for your time, and I'm happy to see a lot of our colleagues joining us all over the world, and hoping to see what has been done so far to, to, to start uh, you know, for us to meet again. So let me start with Jacinta. Jacinta, can you tell us what is the situation in Kenya? Because, you know, I, we saw the, the Convention Bureau engaging with players, engaging with other active, uh, you know, members of the sector to prepare them for the reopening. But then we had the uh, lockdown or the third wave that's happening in Kenya. Does it erode all the things that you are doing? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kojo, and nice to see you all colleagues from around the world. I'm happy to be joining you and sharing some insights uh, from Kenya. Uh, what is happening in Kenya currently, we are on a partial uh, lockdown of uh, five uh, counties, uh, Nairobi included. And what that means is that uh, movement is restricted within uh, these five counties and you cannot 
move outside of uh, those counties. Kenya has 47 counties around, uh, and, and, and so with that restriction, it means that, um, of course, only essential services are allowed. We have um, curfew um, and we have um, restrictions around um, events, no social gatherings within those uh, five uh, counties, including meetings. And uh, this has uh, come at a time when uh, the meetings industry was uh, is trying uh, to restart, to be able to host events in line with the health and protocols that uh, were developed by the, by the Kenya government with the leadership of our minister, Honorable Balala. Uh, so this uh, came just before Easter. And uh, we have seen uh, domestic travel really sustaining the industry within this period. Um, not to say that uh, all that has been done has now been watered down. We, we, we have to remain hopeful. It is pandemic time. It is critical that we all adhere to uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, restrictions and directives. There has been uh, considerations, of course, and, uh, and plea and advocacy, especially uh, from the private sector, to see how to ease some of these restrictions. Because as we speak, uh, domestic flights out of Nairobi are also um, are put on hold uh, indefinitely. Uh, this means a lot to, to, to meeting planners and venues that are outside of the city and would have wished to have hybrid events or even face-to-face -face events with um, uh, delegates coming from these five counties that are now on lockdown. So definitely we, we, we see um, a, a drawback in this and, and, and we are uh, hoping that um, things will get better. This wave is, um, is affecting, you know, like most of the, of the world. And, and what we, we hope is that uh, we'll be able to meet safe and we'll be able to, to meet safely within um, uh, the protocols. Uh, we are looking at, as a convention bureau, to continue to engage the media. As you said, you have seen a lot of engagement with the media and the industry during this period so that we are able to keep ourselves abreast of trends, do researches, conduct surveys, find out what are associations planning to do, uh, what is the future of meetings, and, and we see uh, what sort of innovations can we encourage within our private sector so that we are creating um, 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 a futuristic industry that will be reassuring to the traveler, to the delegate, because that is definitely going to be key. Nobody knows for how long this um, is, is going to last because we are all in a pandemic and we just want to be prepared. I'm very happy to hear the comments from the ambassador from the AU because this gives hope to Africa and the ability for us to work together and professionalize the sector programs like what the MPI um, um, uh, official has uh, talked about, um, uh, Drew, are amazing because the industry needs to be professionalized to be able to rise up and be able to, 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 to seize opportunities so that when we are hosting events, whether hybrid or face-to-face, -face, we are giving a competitive and innovative experience to the delegate. That will make them want to uh, come back to, to our region. Um, uh, Kojo, uh, for, for, for us as, as the Convention Bureau, we were established and then the pandemic hit. And we have been, uh, we have used this time to, to draw a roadmap for the destination. We have uh, laid together a mind strategy for, for Kenya and engage with the private sector and government um, agencies to be able to be, to, to be aligned. We've also developed um, a MICE brand that is ready for, for launch. And um, we will be, uh, of course, unveiling this in the next few weeks. So this is something that has, you know, come at a time when we had to put our thinking caps on, at a time when you, you know, you just want to explore what is possible with, with no baggage um, of previous, you know, um, uh, uh, activations. So we, 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 are, we are opening, um, uh, reopening um, um, uh, our engagement with the industry. Of course, virtual is not going to go away, but we want to be able to offer, you know, support to the sector, our associations, people in the value chain, and as our associations locally to, to, so that we, we professionalize uh, the sector and, and, and be aligned. No, thank you so much. And I, I think that we will come to the bit of what has been done and what is on the ground and what is more realistic also, uh, you, know, uh, you know, going forward on hoping to have an accelerated tourism and mice uh, recovery. Let me come to Kyle. Kyle, I mean, I have the privilege of joining you at the Kigali Arena, and Kyle is the head for Kiwi Solutions. They uh, now manage the Kigali uh, Arena. And uh, for you, you've had some events. In fact, yesterday, uh, during the, uh, the genocide 
observation, you, I, I, we saw that a lot of things have been put in place. In terms of uh, ensuring the protocols, because I know when you get, I mean, when you visit Rwanda, you're supposed to have the PCR there when you are leaving, et cetera. But when it comes to the venue and uh, enforcement of the protocols, how do you balance it between yourself and some of the state actors? Yeah, look, um, I think first of all, th thank you very much for, for this session. And, and it's really great to be a part of it. Um, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of people come together uh, on this and it's, it's good that we have these conversations um, for, from a venue perspective, um, you know, managing the COVID component is, is extremely crucial. Um, we sit in a position where we are actively trying our best to, to open the market and, and get people into, into the space. Um, but at, at no point can we compromise in any way on, on the safety of people. We thankfully are also in a market where, where you know, COVID has been handled extremely well. Um, and, and there are consistent protocols that are, that are uh, put through in the market uh, that make it that much easier for us to, to, to structure our business so that we can receive people as, as best as possible. So in terms of balance, how, how we approach that is really taking, taking the guidance from a government perspective um, and, 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 and implementing that in the venue based on the fact that it's extremely easy to then communicate that over to, to the people attending events. It's something that we do in collaboration with the government um, in, in, in making sure that people are aware of the fact that you know, sanitization is a key uh, uh, point, um, making sure that, that, that tests ha have been done. Um, and there's a lot of integration with the local institutions um, around how we monitor that, how we monitor the fact that people have been tested, um, doing it prior to the event taking place, setting up systems once people are on site um, to, to ensure that once we get into the venue, um, you know, something that's, that's become a very common term is, is, is the bubble effect, um, is that we essentially then become a bubble for that time period. Um, it, it's something that takes days and days of planning. Um, but again, like I say, you know, from a venue perspective, the fact that our surrounding um, environment has, has been structured out so well, um, it, it makes it that much easier. Uh, so, so balancing it against the experience internally um, is, is, is something that we um, sort of take in our stride. People understand that they need to, need to be socially distanced. Um, and with that, we can then make sure from a venue perspective, we are putting on the best um, uh, show possible or event possible um, and, and at least the, the, the compromise on the experience is not felt as much. Um, it's very clean environment, very welcoming environment. Um, and with that, people are able to go about their day um, in comfort and, and of course, um, feeling safe throughout the, the event. What is the sense, I mean, this is a follow-up question. Uh, I mean, uh, what is the sense from the suppliers uh, in terms of uh, some of the restrictions where people are, are up. Yeah, it looks like we lost Kojo, but I think he was trying to get at just for you to just discuss some of the restrictions that, you know, event attendees might have to deal with through the course of, you know, at the venues or some of the things that you're dealing with. I think that's where he was going with the question. Yeah, look, I think, I, I think the, the uh, restrictions of are really the, the common restrictions that are in the markets currently. Uh, social distancing is, is key. Um, testing is a, is, is a key component in this market in particular. Um, and with that, you know, restrictions outside, outside of, 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 of the, the common that, that I've just mentioned, um, you know, it's really the, the individual themselves in, in sort of maintaining through uh, the, the structured environment that we create, so where people walk, uh, where people sit, um, you know, how people interact with each other within the venue, um, are, all, are all areas where, where attendees might feel the restriction. Uh, but again, we, we really try our best to create a, a welcoming environment uh, so that, you know, when people are in the space, yes, that restriction is there, uh, but, but it's not felt as much, um, uh, you know, based on the fact that they are in a very, very safe environment. 
No, thank you, Carl. Uh, Toby, uh, now from the government side, I asking from the Convention Bureau in Cape Town, uh, there's a talk of obviously restarting the sector. And there's a point that, do you think that, you know, government and if you like government agencies probably should lead the restart to stimulate uh, a restart that kind of give some, uh, even looking at the restart itself from your side, if you begin to have events and hold conferences, is this something that uh, you believe that can be a model that some of your colleagues can use in the region? Thank you so much, Kojo. Um, and, uh... Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I'm so happy to see so many, so many friends from the industry here today. Kojo, I think, um, you know, all countries around the globe, and uh, definitely on the African continent, certainly in South Africa, get, like Kyle said, get our direction from the regulations put in place by governments. And these regulations, yes, um, on the face of, of it all might seem to be restricting our business. But at the core, it is to actually protect human life and to protect our businesses in the, into the future. So in terms of um, what governments and what government agencies should be doing to provide, quote unquote, a model to restart the, 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 the industry, it becomes very difficult to say that, yes, there is a model that government can put in place or governments can put in place. It depends on what that country's regulations uh, actually permit people to do. And it also depends on how ready we are as an industry from venues like the CTICC, from hotels, from meeting planners to actually host events safely. At the CTICC, we have um, um, a, a program we call the C19 Care Program, which is our, our safety protocol on how to host events safely within our venue. And uh, this is also informed by what we can actually do legally based on the regulations in the country. And as you know, regulations change so regularly depending on we are in terms of the COVID infections. I mean, South Africa has gone from level five all the way to level one. In December, we were back at level three of lockdown. We are back at level one, but it's also an adjusted level one with some restrictions. So it becomes very tricky to actually say that this is the model to use and this model will work across the board for everybody. It depends on your country, it depends on the regulations, and it depends on your readiness as an organization or as a meeting planner to be able to host events safely. And I think it's very important to reiterate that if we cannot host events safely, we are killing our business for the long term. So, and it is important for meeting planners to have confidence hosting their events in a venue, that a venue has got its systems in place to secure and make sure that events are safe. It's important for a client to have confidence that a meeting planner and the venue and any other supplier has got what it takes and has got the systems in place to ensure that delegates are safe, the event owners are safe, that they, we will not be um, the term that is used uh, when we host event, we will not be a super spreader industry. And uh, we know very well that uh, that is what has been seen. And that is why the, the, the restrictions are so much more harsher for our industry, because we, we congregate large numbers of people come together, and we are seen as potential super spreaders. So it is absolutely paramount that we put safety first, and understand the regulations so that we can work within the regulations and develop a business model that works for your particular organization, country, city, and uh, the business that you're in. Okay, no, thank you, uh, Toby. Nick, uh, let me let me for someone who is your side. I mean, I mean, used to be heading Qatar, and now you know in the meetings industry proper. 
do you think that they, you know they talk about uh, passport vaccination or you know having a passport to be able to to restart something is real? I mean, we know that in terms of the coverage area, it's time to reach most parts of the world, much more so in Africa. How do we then uh, look at how we can regulate? Because until we have full coverage, we still have to begin with our meetings. How do we balance the two? Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and I'm pleased to see colleagues that I haven't seen uh, for over a year now, uh, you know, uh, physically, but looking forward and remain hopeful, uh, just like many of us that soon uh, we shall be meeting. Uh, Kojo, you know, the, the question you asked um, is, remains a controversial question, you know, across the globe. Um, as you know, the, the whole discussions around vaccination in itself uh, has been controversial and it's not a new thing. I think uh, um, the, the vaccination question has been, um, is as old as, as a discovery of, of vaccination. And yet um, we are an industry that is desperate to start. You know, we are an industry that actually require to give confidence uh, to the people that we host uh, and the people that we bring together um, that they remain safe. So um, I think the, the, the whole idea around the uh, uh, vaccination, you know, uh, passport is, um, is, is a good idea because it, 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 it provides planners like us um, um, and, and, and also hosts um, that the people they bring together are people that actually have some form of, 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 of security in terms of their first safety, they, they've been vaccinated and such. Um, however, I think there's also the potential of this disadvantaging um, certain quarters um, based on the politics around, around the vaccination. Um, and, and particularly, I speak to um, uh, countries here in Africa where access to vaccination remains a challenge. Um, and, and in view of the fact that a lot of the, of, of the countries that actually produce this um, uh, vaccination and are also well off, they, they are also uh, concerned about satisfying the need internally in their own country. So by the time uh, we get our population vaccinated here in Africa, I think it's estimated. No, we are talking about 2023 at the earliest, 2024, 2025, um, and we can't wait. So I think there will be need to find how do we balance uh, to ensure that indeed um, um, there is access to the, to the vaccination, uh, but also we do not disadvantage uh, nations and, and regions that... Um, um, that are, you know, uh, disadvantaged not not out of their own making, uh, out of travel. So, so I think it's it, it calls for a bigger balance, and and it will talk, it will it calls for collaborations and partnership, global partnerships, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, these vaccines actually do reach each and every uh, um, uh, part of the of the country. However, um, I also find that the, the, there is a, a silver lining uh, for us. Um, and, and I've always been speaking about uh, the need as African to work together, you know, be able to create the intra-Africa um, uh, travel, you know, business amongst ourselves. So that uh, should these restrictions become such that they prevent us to access uh, the international market, then we find a mechanism, you know, within the AU that allows us to continue the business and to, 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 to work towards the reopening of the continent. Uh, of course, with some um, agreed formula on how uh, we want to go around the vaccine issues. However, I think for me in the short term, it's going to be a very controversial issue and we shouldn't really be rushing towards that. Um, having said that, however, but I also want to uh, call upon African governments to be able to prioritize the people that work in the tourism sector. We need to see this as a frontline people, just like we are taking care of our, um, our, our, our frontline workers in the health sector and security sector. I think we need to begin to see how do we prioritize the people that work within the, the tourism and meeting sector so that we can give the confidence to people that come 
on to the continent that whoever who is dealing with us and whoever is serving us, actually uh, they've been vaccinated. So that's where we'll put uh, an emphasis on uh, Kojo um, as a start. I think that's a good point because uh, coming from Rwanda uh, a week ago and uh, at the Kigali Arena, uh, obviously they had 85% of the tourism industry players being uh, you know, uh, vaccinated. But uh, from the association point of view, what is it that you guys are doing in terms of engaging government? Because this is a call on them, but have you sat down and have you, uh, I mean, like you said, if anything has, has uh, you know, taught us uh, how we can you know, progress with tourism and mice on the continent is about collaboration and partnerships. We've, we, you know, we've been speaking about intra-African travels for years. And uh, if we have to progress, because Africa, in spite of all the challenges, we've seen a, a, you know, uh, a better management of this pandemic. How have you engaged with authorities to ensure that they give uh, not just meetings, but the tourism uh, industry players you know, some priority when it comes to uh, taking the jobs? Um, you know, uh, Kojo, the, the truth has been that um, this COVID has been a sting, uh, you know, to many associations. And, and a lot of association leadership has focused on, um, I think, for the, for the last one year, in terms of how do we preserve business? How do we keep uh, our specific industry as a going concern? So a lot of efforts has been expended on advocating, you know, for... Um, the survival of the businesses at 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 at, at a national you know level, um, whether it is dealing with the um, frequent and I think uh, regular uh, um, uh, restrictions that are that are imposed you know um, at very short notice, um, whether it is to see how we can uh, ask governments to step in to ensure that actually they are supporting the industry and ensuring that the business uh, don't totally uh, collapse. Uh, so that is what has um, uh, a lot of associations have focused on, uh, if you ask me, in the last uh, 12, 12 months. However, um, we are beginning to see some uh, creativity around our advocacy agenda as associations so that uh, we begin to speak loudly around the issue of uh, prioritization of the, of the reopening um, of the industry. Um, just the other day, I think I, I saw, um, I think it is an association um, of hoteliers in, in, in Botswana. They want to be at the forefront in procuring vaccination for their industry. And actually, they're, they're even going ahead and saying, we are willing to be able, if, if it means paying to get our members vaccinated, uh, we are willing to be able to offset those costs from government uh, and extend those costs to our members. So um, I think what we're going to see is a lot of, uh, a little bit more engagement, you know, from the associations to practically and uh, literally begin to engage just beyond the discussions of government, but also to put some resources uh, to ensure that they are taking care of, 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 of their members um, in a proactive manner. And, and not just to wait for government uh, and engage with government at, at a policy level, but really to see how do we uh, push uh, for the vaccination and, and when it needs for us to be able to mobilize resources to just supplement what government is, I think I'm seeing the flexibility of associations uh, being able to do. Um, but also to add on to this, uh, what we are seeing is a lot of call for collaboration, you know, um, between associations, for instance, and venues to say, hey, how do we support each other uh, to be able to, to, to restart the industry again? You know, we are seeing venues saying, come, we are able to give you the technical uh, skills, the technical tools that you may need to host your meetings um, and support you to confidently host those meetings in our venues. And I think that has been uh, quite, quite um, a great support and an engagement that I'm seeing uh, associations are proactively going out to see how do we uh, reopen the industry as soon as possible, Kojo. Thank you, Nick. Uh, let, me, let me go to Toby. Toby, now, uh, when are we going to meet again? That is the question. But the main point also is the fact that we won't go back to normal. So what have you put in place or uh, your agency put in place to ensure that, look, virtual, digital, hybrid like we are having now has become part and parcel uh, of the sector? And then building the capacity of uh, the PCOs or your main stakeholders would also be a very key thing that we will use to, to, you know, to help us restart. 
from your end. What is it that you've done to at least give some uh, some hope, you know, of, of some optimism that we can come back to even uh, better way of uh, uh, you know doing mice. Your microphone is off, please. If you can yes, turn big yeah. question, Kojo. Um, when are we going to meet again? I wish I knew. Um, I think that's the million dollar question that everybody wants to know. Every time we think we are about to get over it and we're going to meet and then something else happened, we, we go through a second wave. Uh, other countries are talking about a third and a fourth wave. So I think what we can do and it is such great news to hear that uh, Rwanda is leading the African pack where 85% of uh, the tourism industry uh, players, they have been vaccinated. I know that Kenya is also doing quite well in South Africa, um, the tourism industry and um, people over the age of 65 and people with comorbidities will be vaccinated in the second phase of the vaccination rollout which is um, planned for the end of May. And uh, I think we can put all sorts of plans in place. But uh, what Nikano is saying that vaccination is very, very important for us to get to a place where we can comfortably say that we are now ready and can reasonably be safe to meet in person again. But until that happens, until we've got what the president of South Africa calls population immunity, or some people call it herd immunity, in most of the countries that are mice players in, on, on the continent, we need to do everything in our power to put systems in place. As the Cape Town International Convention Center, what we have done is, um, I mentioned earlier on our C19 care program which is a program that allows uh, visitors to, to, to our building, and we are a public building, suppliers, clients, our staff, and anybody else that enters our building and has events in our building, including the film industry in Cape Town, that guides, it's a guide on how to host your events uh, safely. What are the requirements that you have to meet to come into the building and do your events. What are the, the, the actions we take? Should there be a, a concern that somebody might be exposed? Isolation rooms that we have set up at, at the center. Uh, if there is a, we have put in place a digitally based um, COVID screening app that anybody that comes into the building has to register on, and it is in compliance with the the uh, the Poppy Act, which is the Protections of Inf of Personal Information Act in South Africa, and also other international legislation protecting personal information. It is also something that is linked to the National Department of Data, um, of Health database in South Africa for tracking. Um, should I have gone into the building? and I then present with symptoms and I'm, I test positive later. So I think what needs to happen is that um, collaboration does not only mean coming together and hosting events. Collaboration also means that we share those, those resources if we can, we share information about how other players in the industry, other partners, other venues, other countries can also implement similar programs to ensure that as the African continent, we have a common thread of safety and safety protocols around, around the continent in, in, in all our venues by meeting planners. Clients understand that it doesn't matter where they go on the continent. There is a standard that the continent has got in terms of hosting events safely. So, we are very happy as the CTICC to share what we have done so far. And I know I've got a colleague of mine, um, our GM for commercial, uh, Robert Hutton Jones on the, on, the, on the meeting right now. And I will ask him to share the links uh, for our C9 
C19 care program so that we, we share that uh, resource with uh, all the, the, the people on the call and also to share the, the link to the COVID screen um, app that was developed by the University of the Witwatersrand, Rand, uh, the medical uh, side of it. So those are the kind of things that we need to do as the industry. We must just not talk collaboration and wait for us to meet in person to, to collaborate. We must collaborate now to prepare us to be able to meet in person. Thank you, Toby. Uh, Jacinta, so if you, I mean, obviously, I mean, when we had this uh, COVID or, I mean, when it was declared a, a pandemic and we couldn't travel again and all of that, uh, you know, all attention shifted to, to domestic, even in the mainstream tourism. You know, now as an as a as a convention bureau, and hoping to 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 stimulate the market with domestic uh, 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 event or activities, how sustaining can that be until you know we get the international uh, markets going? Um, uh, Kujo, when you look at um, at the value um, of of the meetings events. And, and meetings, industry, and, 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 and events. And here I want to focus a lot on business uh, events, um, which, which is what we are talking about here in MICE. Um, business events thrive in a, an economy that is thriving. That is when there are discussions around issues, about growth, about topics that are emerging. That's when people can have conferences and discussions around moving the economies forward. So it is about the entire economy. You don't, it's not just about people traveling. Um, so this, of course, becomes you know key because as a domestic um, a, a market for all the countries, there is just how much you're able to, 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 to sustain the, the industry. And a lot of the, of the FBI that comes into destinations is what is big in the meetings industry. Uh, MICE is, is a catalyst for, 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 for economic growth. And the FDI is what brings in majority of this. This is when you have big conferences and meetings and discussions that bring in visitation into your destination. So it's just like relying on leisure travel for the domestic. It is good, it sustains, but it is not enough. And we know we have the potential as a continent, as a country to hold more. Of, 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 of meetings. I look at um, uh, uh, destinations focusing a lot on um, uh, risk management, you know, programming for, for meetings. Business events are easier to manage than social gatherings because these are professionals. These are people who register, you know where they are, you know who is staying where, who is being picked from where to where, and you can manage the interactions within your venue. And a venue can absolutely adhere to the protocols and ensure that all the mitigations are put in place. It is easier than you know, a social gathering. So I see the, the possibility of associations, private sector being able to, to work together with governments so that that reassurance is, is given to the, to, to the government in, in order for review or reconsiderations of some of these restrictions, but not just going back to government and say, you've closed our businesses, we are gonna die. I mean, th there has to be science behind some of these decisions. And, and, and I, I, I'm looking also at um, the need for cultural change in terms of how we think um, uh, we should be handling this. I mean, nobody created um, uh, uh, this problem on our businesses. It is all of us to embrace and, and focus on sustaining our lives and our businesses in the future and just work together. Your question to Nick was, was spot on. What have associations done to engage? How can we demonstrate how smooth, how professional a business event can be conducted? You know, you can even have infection mitigation coordinators, somebody just going through the entire value chain to confirm and reassure um, uh, 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 the, uh, government and delegates that everything has been put in place. So for me, that is, is, is critical. And I want to support what uh, Toby said, until we are all ready and sure and confident that we can hold meetings safely, 
it is not we are not yet ready until we can confirm that okay thank you thank you so much carl i mean you are going to have the privilege of hosting the ball i mean the basketball uh, africa league uh, in, in 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 middle of may now uh with respect to the new normal where we have to look at things like the space and all of that how are you going to have the balance between having this you know super high event sport event like that at the same time with respect to cost efficiency because we also came to understand that uh in fact virtual or hybrid <laughs> wasn't that cheap or alternative or i mean it's expensive so how do you balance that in the midst of a pandemic that people we don't have literally have budgets how do we then proceed with that yeah look um, i think institutions like like bal um have the fortunate opportunity of a, a huge amount of interest in the event um, and that naturally then shifts the focus from, from your standard sort of revenue opportunities like ticketing, for instance, uh, food and beverage within your arena um, to, to elements like sponsorship, which, which become a, a big component of, of uh, events um, that are now hosting the, the activities without any fans in the space. Um, I, th I think, you know, prior to COVID, uh, sponsorship was a, a, a key component and will always be. Um, but there's just that much more emphasis on, on going out there and structuring your business um, to, to really showcase its ability to, to pull people from a digital perspective. Um, so I think that, that from, a, from a sort of high level perspective is, is a key contributor to the, the revenue that these, these, these um, events uh, pull. From a venue perspective, we of course have to change our model slightly uh, where we would benefit from people being in the space. Um, the, the focus now comes on, on how do we streamline operations as much as possible, um, work with the, with the event owners um, to, to really structure out a process in, in getting the event into the space and out of the, the space as, as quick as possible. Uh, utilizing as, as little of the venue's uh, operations as possible to, to, to get this exercise done. Um, and with that, we see a bit of a streamlined process in, in getting into the venue. Of course, um, you know, the venue capacity reduces uh, um, substantially because people are not in the space. So that, again, is a way of, of really streamlining the, the, the operations. I think if anything, it's, it's a combined effort between us as the venue owner, uh, the, the venue management company um, and the event owners um, in working together to, to, to really help uh, alleviate costs as much as possible so that we can, we can turn our focus to generating revenue in, in new ways and, and, and you know, with, with new opportunities coming, um, coming with this pandemic. Um, I, you know, I, I think as a business, we like to look at, at where that silver lining is. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we do see a bit of an uptake in, in people watching um, um, sporting shows like the BAL. Um, and, and with that, we then need to craft our, our um, uh, showcase to, to really um, sort of light up the, 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 the visual aspects when people are watching from home or, or wherever, wherever they're watching from. Um, so, so, so the balance goes across. Really, it's it's it's, it's more of an integrated approach. And, and when I say integrated, is it across us as the venue managers and the event owners to make sure that we 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 keeping costs as low as possible, but positioning this event as best as we can um, through the pandemic, so that people watch it, people engage with it, and people learn from it. Okay, now. Uh... I mean, it's it's um, it's easier to deal with the suppliers. I mean, at the at the venue. But what's your narrative to the consumers? For example, having this sporting event, what do you tell them? How do you proceed? You know, uh, let people understand uh, the risk and what have been put in place, so that as a layperson who wants to come to the Kigali Arena or any other venue, he or she has you know in mind what is it that is expected uh, of uh, of him coming there. Him on her, yes. Yeah, look, I think 
I think we, uh, as we're talking through it, we, we're starting to hear that you know it's it's very much a a uh, focus on what the regulations are in the market at at that given time. Um, you know, as being in Rwanda at the moment, we consistently engaging with the government institutions and seeing you know what what are the regulations how can we assist in in, in structuring the regulations out specific for the venue uh, what contribution can we make to 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 those guidelines because um, at the end of the day as, as people who are in the industry you know prior to COVID, we have been working on how best to move people through the venue um, you know, for people's safety, um, um, which is which is a key component of any event that we host. So taking that as as a, as a learning and then shifting it over into this uh, time of the pandemic, um, our communication structures don't really change much. Um, it's just how we communicate that to 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 the the fans that are coming into the space, um, and of course. Once they come into the space, is a continuation and reminder of of, of uh, people's safety um, in the venue. Um, it, it goes back to a comment that I I'd mentioned earlier, where again, you know, being very fortunate of of being in an in an environment where where COVID has been handled and communication is consistent on a daily basis, um, with very strict regulations on how people um, um, handle themselves within the pandemic. Uh, making sure masks are, are, are worn at all times. Um, walking into any venue, you make sure that the point of the sanitization points are set up. Um, and, and, and with that collaboration between ourselves and government, um, it makes it that much easier that, you know, four, five, six days prior, or even two weeks prior to the event, that communication is already starting to happen with the fans coming into the space. Communication on how they need to interact with the venue, um, what they need to do prior to getting into the venue. Um, and once they're in the space, you know, the social distancing seating is clearly marked on where people can sit and where they can't sit. Um, and, and working towards uh, events like the BAL um, that, that work in these, these bubbles um, makes it that much easier. So, so we've got a clear separation between fans coming into the space um, as well as the event itself. Um, and, and that helps with, with just sort of getting the messaging out there that it's a very safe environment, not only for the fans, but also for the players coming in. Um, they are comfortable to perform at the highest level, uh, knowing that all the precautions have been taken around them. Um, and then, you know, uh, changing back over to the fans, they, they know that they can come into the space and enjoy what, what is taking place uh, in the comfort of knowing that the venue has gone through the, the necessary precautions to make sure that it's a safe environment. Um, so it's a communication, communication, communication. It's, it's extremely key. Uh, and like I say, as, as venues, we are not new to this. We have been moving people in and out of venues for a very long time. Um, and, and it's just emphasizing um, the, 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 the situation as people move through the process. Okay, Nick. You, you, you touched on a very key thing about partnership, collaboration to, you know, to get us going again. Now, let me stay on it a little bit, you know, with respect to even local businesses in Kenya, in Ghana, in South Africa. Sometimes you find out that the key stakeholders, I mean, you have the, either the convention center and then, uh, the, you know, airport authority or the tourism board or something. They are working in silos. Now, if we are to ensure that the meeting space or the mind space are to come out stronger. We have been talking about building, you know, partnership. Uh, ATP had an event last week, you know, at the masterclass where they're looking at the, uh, the coalition for convention bureaus. How are we, how do we start? Because you're not going to get everybody coming on board, but how do we move from the cliche and the talk and the documents of intra-African travels of uh, you know, uh, uh, convention bureaus, and even beginning from home, whether in Kenya or South Africa or Ghana or Rwanda, then we can be able to you know, carry people along to ensure that this is what we're, we're working towards. Because Africa's meetings, some of the meetings are moved out of the continent. Can we have these convention bureaus that we, you know, we're talking about, the coalition, that we ensure that even for strategic reason that we bring events should go to East or Western Central Africa 
or North Africa. What is your AFSAI and the other partners working on to ensure that it doesn't just become a document that we've read over and over again, and then uh, people just refer to it? Um, that, that's a very good question, you know, Kojo, uh, because for, for as long as uh, I've been in this industry, you know, we, we've, we've spoken about collaborations, we've spoken about uh, partnership. And um, I think um, the, the intervention or the interruption um, by COVID for me is a reality check, you know, um, that when um, uh, the... Um, when 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 we we are faced with the reality of of life, people tend to retract to their domestic, to their home, you know, and, and that's what uh, COVID has really you know shown us that uh, you know we have thrived over the years um, uh, with with international travel, but the reality is that when things get thick, people run home fast. So that speaks to the need of us as Africans to really begin to rethink how do we want to do a business as tourism and, and also just as, as, as meeting industry. You know, we compete amongst ourselves and competition is, is, is very healthy and it actually uh, builds us. But the reality is that when you have a crisis like this, more or less we need to work shoulder by shoulder, you know. Um, I have seen um, some great work that even has happened locally here, you know, uh, from, for, for example, here in Kenya, you know, with associations and government um, agencies working together towards how do we create a solution. And a very good example um, uh, for me happened recently when all of a sudden uh, we, were, we, we, were, we were asked to go into restrictions. And, 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 and a lot of associations um, did lobby government and say it wasn't just practical to say we are closing this evening. And, and, and have everybody, you know, shut. So government had to give a bit of an allowance to extend. And I think it's that kind of collaboration, is that kind of uh, a partnership and understanding that helps the industry, you know, uh, uh, do better. So having, having said about um, that, these are some of my thoughts, you know, uh, particularly in the short and, and the, and the midterm. As associations, um, and pa particularly Pan-African associations, we've had meetings that rotate across the continent, uh, but also the truth is that there are some meetings that are meant to, they are, they are African meetings, but unfortunately they are being hosted um, uh, out of the continent. I think we really need to push that those meetings are brought here. And for us to be able then to succeed, I want to see how the convention bureaus, you know, Jacinta and, um, and, 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 and your colleagues, you know, in Rwanda and, and South Africa and Ethiopia, how do we work together to ensure that we are pushing for these um, uh, meetings that rotate across the continent? How do we learn from each other? How do we support each other to say, if Kenya hosts this meeting, what are some of the lessons that are learned? So how do we go to that association and say, hey, next let's push this meeting to a different um, uh, destination. And these are the lessons that we have learned because the reality is that for the next three years, it will be Africans for Africans, you know? By the time we build the confidence to be able to bring the international uh, you know, audiences into our meeting, it's gonna take a bit time to build that, that confidence. So in the interim, we have no choice but partner and work together. If, if I find a venue like CTICC, and, 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 and Toby, I think in terms of prepare, preparedness, uh, I must say CTICC has done quite a, quite a good job in terms of pivoting to the new reality of, 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 of the hybrid meetings, you know, in terms of preparations. So how do we say a venue like CTICC, uh, based on like what you share, you know, the COVID-19 protocols uh, that you've created, how do we share such an experience with a venue like the, Kenya, uh, the Kenyatta International Convention Center here in Nairobi, or with the Rwanda, uh, you know, um, uh, the Kigali Convention Center down in Rwanda? What are some of the learning things so that we collectively build the brand Africa? As the ambassador was saying, we must collectively build the brand Africa because um, uh, when, when, when disaster struck, Africa is seen as one. So you're, gonna not, you're not going to say, and say no, 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 you know, uh, we are South Africa. No, 
They, they talk about Africa. So we must be able to defend that brand Africa. And we can only defend that brand Africa when we open to learning and interlearning amongst ourselves, you know, as, as, as players um, uh, in the industry. So what are some of those key lessons that Kyle, for instance, has learned by hosting these major events um, at the Kigali uh, uh, arena that other venues of similar nature can learn? Are you willing to be able to share so that we are not reinventing the wheel, but if it has worked for Rwanda, can we also find a way of transferring that, you know, to um, uh, to Kenya and South Africa or, or Nigeria or Ghana? You know, that, that, that that's going to be very key. And that will not happen unless us as a practitioners that actually know where uh, it hurts most decides to do that. You know, for government bureaucrats, they have different interests and they may want to, um, to, to defend those national interests. But for us as practitioners, we must be able to move beyond those national interests to say that we, we want to recreate this business. And that can only work. Lucky enough, we know each other. So we must be able to push that agenda to say that we are going to work and not mm -hmm. be selfish um, at this point of view. So, so that's what I see um, as, 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 as key in terms of then beginning to put the reality and the discussion into practice. Uh, Kojo, I, th I think that's what I see um, in terms of us practically beginning to move this needle uh, towards a collaboration and partnership. No, I think, uh, you know, it's something that personally I'll charge you that the next time that we are meeting, you, you know, you're able to, 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 to tell us what has been done and uh, what is it that, because we need to get, you know, the African uh, mind sector going. Jacinta, uh, in wrapping up, uh, what is it that the Convention Bureau in Kenya is doing to reassure its partners and you know the people in, in Africa about how you want to uh, restart soon, but at the same time, the balance of ensuring that your stakeholders understand the message? Because sometimes I can understand the pressure from the supplies, from, I mean, from the PCOs. And we know livelihoods have been, you know, it's, a, a, you know, it's, it's has been lost. So how do you then communicate to them and also assure them of how they can be part of restarting a rapid mines sector in Kenya? Uh, uh, thank you, Kojo. Um, uh, restarting a rapid mines sector is, um, <laughs> is, is a bit, <laughs> maybe asking too much because um, uh, the, the situation is really dicey for, for all of us, uh, both the public and, uh, and the private. Um, in terms of communicating and ensuring that we, 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 we give hope and, and um, align our direction as a, as a destination, um, uh, I'm looking at um, avenues where we are able to, 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 to mine what we have currently within uh, our borders. We have um, associations headquartered here. Some are regional, African, headquartered here, the national domestic associations. Already those are leads that, you know, planners can engage and be able to get them to, to have meetings uh, within uh, the, 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 the borders. Um, as we work towards investing as, as, as venues and, 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 and players in workable venues and also in workable platforms that can deliver, you know, quality hybrid events, we must, we must also uh, look at how to monetize and ensure that there is proper ROI on these uh, hybrid events because they're, they're quite expensive to host. So investing in the right infrastructure, uh, 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 capacity building of our people, our staff, our service providers to be able to, 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 uh, to embrace this new way of having meetings is, is critical for the sector. So those are things that um, the Convention Bureau, we, we want to put um, uh, focus on, and especially in capacity building and being able to to push on the on the government's role to 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 ensure that uh, the ICT um, uh, areas and issues are, are are sorted. I also look at um, the Pan African agencies that are that are based in either Kenya or in Africa. AU is one of them. I mean, government and such agencies are big. Uh, um, uh, clients for meetings, and these meetings should be held within our region. You know, let how can we uh, approach them and ensure that uh, those meetings are 
um, 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 uh, within the region, they could alternate from one country to the other or one, you know, small region of a country to away from the capitals that, uh, that, 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 that they are used to uh, holding so that we are able to keep uh, sustaining um, uh, the industry. Uh, the other thing, of course, is um, to ensure this continued collaboration really works. And, 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 and for both uh, government and private sector to, to just keep talking, keep sharing um, uh, um, uh, ideas and cases. And, and within our communication with the sector, we always share with them trends within the sector. What case studies have we you know, put, laid our hands on to be able uh, for them also to learn? And, and be, you know, we keep bidding for, for, for meetings that are happening in 2022, 2023, and we, we, we are winning some of these bids. And we, we just need to keep, you know, hope in doing so and engaging, you know, the PCOs and venues to jointly bid with us so that um, as, as, as uh, the world gets more comfortable once, you know, the, the, the immunity is built, then we are able to resume uh, a face to face. But in the interim, we just have to keep, you know, innovating. Let us look at those unique venues and locations in, in, in Kenya and in Africa that are so unique. You can, you, you don't have to be limited by numbers, but you, you can host, you know, outdoor events. You can get people, you know, feel, feel a bit engaged um, uh, so that, you know, the, the industry doesn't just stop and wait for post COVID because that will not find us prepared. That will not find us ready. Uh, to be able to 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 take on um, um, uh, the, the the industry demands. Thank you so much, Jacinta. Uh, Kyle, you know you'll be hosting this event, like I said, in May. Uh, you know, middle of May, and like uh, Nick reiterated, you know, we do things amongst ourselves as Africa sometimes to benchmark. Now, in the restart, that will be a very key area, or will be something that people will be watching. What exactly will be done, and when you have this event that it's uh, you know it's well organized sometimes you know it's it brings some confidence some some level of optimism so from your side how do you uh, intend to, not just for for uh for bal but also for for chogam where i know some events may take place uh, at your end how are you uh, preparing yourself to ensure that at least this event might be some benchmarking tool for 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 uh, some of our countries. Yeah, look, uh, it's it's a very very important point, and and we as 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 a business see this as a huge opportunity um, to one, like you say, bring in that confidence um, into the market, um, and hopefully, you know, it's it's confidence that 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 spreads across across the continent um, at 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 whole. Um, for us as, as a business preparation leading up to, to the BAL event um, has really focused around our marketing um, and, and what that communication is going to be into the market locally, regionally, and of course, international. Um, we are using the, the fact that, you know, you've got a, a great institution like BAL who have pressure tested the, the bubble format on many occasions, uh, given the fact that they are um, um, owned by, by institutions like the NBA and, and FIBA, uh, who have run uh, bubble formats across, across the globe um, and are now bringing it to the continent. So from a venue perspective, we're saying to ourselves, well, you know, we got to really maximize on the opportunity um, of communicating our ability in being able to host these bubble formats as a start um, that would then become a, a tool to gradually open up our markets uh, to a point where we can host uh, major events um, uh, across the continent. Um, so so with that, you know, looking over the next month, uh, going into the, 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 the month of, of May, uh, we really are setting ourselves up and saying, well, one, you know, we've got a great venue, uh, Kigali Arena, that, that is really uh, poised to be a, a model, I believe, uh, for, for venue developments across the continent. Um, and, if, and if we maximize on these opportunities where major institutions like VAL, like Chogham, are coming into the market, um, we can really start to send out a clear message 
um, that our ability to host events and our ability to host events in a safe environment is there. Um, and and if, we, if we sit down and plan accordingly, um, we can gradually open up our market. Uh, I, think, I think to, to um, some of the points that, that were mentioned, um, uh, Nick and Noor made a really great point on collaboration. Um, I think this is, these are opportunities that, one, we shouldn't take as, as individual countries, uh, but really start to sit down and, and discuss on, on, on ways of how these, these templates can be replicated um, across the continent. Um, because the opportunity that's come with the pandemic um, is, is, is that opportunity of sitting down and really starting to craft out what the intra-trade um, on, on the continent looks like like from a tourism and eventing perspective um, that, I, that I think is crucial. If, if we come out of the pandemic with some sort of structure and, and plan, um, you know, it, it will really set us up uh, combined with these marketing efforts of saying we are ready as, as an industry to, to accept these major events. Uh, we can really set ourselves up for the, for the, for the years to come um, in, in being able to bid and secure uh, some major events on the continent. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Toby, I think you would have the last words. Uh, what are your last words, but also uh, from, uh, yes, I know the situation you know, varies from country to country, but uh, are you seeing uh, you know, a bit, even if it's slow, uh, in terms of uh, corporate events and uh, domestic events that you are you know, uh, very sure that would be a, a test case for you know, decision makers in terms of what is next for the uh, for the country or for the mine sector in South Africa. Hoja, thank you so much, and um, thanks everyone, all the panelists, for a great session. It has been very illuminating today. Um, we are seeing definitely in Cape Town at and at the Cape Town International Convention Center a very slow but steady. Um, come back to hosting events. They might be smaller in number, but um, you know, in South Africa, we have got what is called the SA Events Council that has worked with other industry associations to host what we call proof of concept events to show government how we can actually host events safely. And there's quite a few that have been hosted and they've been hosted safely. And what do we mean by safely is that no infections were reported because of those events that were hosted. And at the CTICC, we are beginning to host smaller events, but regular events that are coming up. Uh, we just hosted um, a netball tournament. Um, and I like the, what Carl is talking about, where we are able to create a bubble for safe events to happen, like sporting events. And definitely that, that is what we are currently doing to say, if we can host a netball tournament with Namibia and other countries, and it's done safely, and the netball associations from around those countries feel confident that as a sector, we are ready to, to do that, then those are really examples of what we are capable of doing. A lot of people on the chat have been saying that uh, business events are probably the safest way for people to congregate. And that is true. And uh, these proof of concept events that we are seeing across South Africa and some parts of the continent are really important because they say to our, to our governments, as much as there are regulations, as much as there are restrictions of numbers, here are concepts or proof of concepts that can show you that we are ready and very capable to start ramping up the, 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 the events sector, the meetings industry to host even more so that we can get recovery. So I'm very confident that um, one, with the rollout of the vaccine, secondly, with the, the, the sharing of the resources and the, 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 the know-how or the guides on how to do it safely by people who have done it safely. I'm very confident that um, governments across the continent of Africa will start to see that we are more ready than we think we are, actually. 
Um, and uh, we'll actually start to look at how to ease restrictions around business events. So I am very optimistic, um, but that's just me. I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, but I believe that there truly is light at the end of the tunnel, or as I like to say, there is light in the tunnel. Uh, we, are seeing, we are seeing that there is recovery. I mean, there's an article that was published that uh, actually said that South Africa has um, become number two in terms of uh, global uh, business travel recovery. And that is very important. It shows us that it is possible to recover. We just have to make sure that we support each other across the continent as an industry to make sure that as many countries as possible on the continent are able to host meetings so that the international community then has confidence. Like Nikano say, we are seen as, unfortunately, most of the time as one country. If you say I'm from the continent of Africa and they hear that there's one part of the continent that is not doing so well, we all suffer. So we need to collaborate to ensure that all of us benefit from the best practices and the, the knowledge that somebody else has on how to do it safely so that we can all benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. On the level of, uh, on the note of optimism, I think I would like to say thank you to everyone, Jacinta, Toby, Kyle, and then Nick for this very uh, fascinating and insightful session. And may we never come back to the conversation of having to refer to the cliche of intra-Africa intra travels and, and having coalition. We have to make it work. And I'm very confident that as Africans, uh, Africa is the future. Minds definitely is a key part or a core part because, it, 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 you know, it's... It, 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 it gives you a faster uh, ROI uh, than the other, you know, uh, sectors of of the tourism industry. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to all our 115 participants who stayed with us, and hope to be back on the town hall again. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day, and hope to see you very soon. So we don't have this town hall here, but we we, we have it in, in 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 South Africa, Kenya, and uh, yeah, Rwanda. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Indeed, thank you. Thank you very much, Kojo. Thank you to each one of our panelists in that CEO town hall. It has been an engaging conversation. Thank you for the insights. We are very delighted to have had you. So I would like to begin, uh, first of all, by introducing myself. My name is Kezi Mukiri. I am uh, the event director for the Africa My Summit. And I want to begin my remarks just by saying thank you to His Excellency Ambassador Mchanga for the, uh, from the African uh, Union Commission, not only for joining us this morning, but also for demonstrating um, the commitment of the AUC um, towards uh, realigning the priorities for recovery and the development of the mice sector here in Africa. At the beginning of the pandemic uh, in 2020, ourselves at the Africa My Summit began a series of dialogue with the African Union Commission around the elevation of conversations on mice and business tourism at a continental level. That particular dialogue uh, with the AUC is what initiated our collaboration with the Africa Tourism Association, which in turn has led to our co-hosting of today's very special GMID Africa event. The work of the Africa My Summit began sometime back in 2017 in Nairobi, Kenya. The summit was formed as an inclusive intracontinental platform created to initiate and enhance the dialogue on the development of mice across Africa. And over the past three years, we have worked steadily to build collaborations and partnerships within the continent, but also across the globe. Right now, um, the different collaborations and the partnerships that we have built have helped to cascade our efforts in highlighting the critical contributions uh, of the meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions industry towards the social and economic development of our respective countries here in Africa. The MICE uh, Summit now has regional representatives across the continent of Africa, 
and is geared to become a rotating event, which will be hosted in the different, uh, our different destinations here in Africa. By doing this, we at the Africa My Summit hope to make our own contribution, as well as spur the growth and emergence of authentic Africa-focused event concepts, which are able to build the capacity to not only drive the FDI to the continent, but also shift the narrative about the true worth and value of our industry. We are of the perspective that even as we wait for the resumption of you know, international business meetings and conferences, that we industry players on this call, um, we ought to build our capacity to elevate uh, African events that can rotate on the continent. In 2019, uh, myself um, here in Nairobi as an industry stakeholder, I mobilized and held the very first local GMID event here in Nairobi with just under 100 industry stakeholders. We are therefore very excited to see how far we have come, not just as you know, smaller industry players, but the collaborations being driven across the continent even towards hosting this uh, first uh, uh, GMID Africa event. In 2020, with the lobbying of the Africa My Summit, the meeting's main business coalition recognized the importance of a specially designated day, named the Africa Meetings Industry Day, which will be celebrated annually on the 9th of September. The purpose of the Africa Meetings Industry Day is to mobilize the growth and development of the meetings industry and to appreciate the work that our industry colleagues are involved in. We therefore wish to invite you all to join us during this year's Africa My Summit and Awards, which will be hosted as a hybrid event um, from right here in Nairobi. This summit will be held on the 9th to 11th of September, 2021, and will anchor the Africa Meetings Industry Day celebrations across Africa. We would like to encourage everyone to stay connected and move beyond today's dialogue to action in our respective areas of impact. As we now come to a close, I would like to thank the Africa Tourism Association for this collaboration and for everything that has been achieved through this collaboration. Thank you, Naledi, for taking the lead in driving our collaboration with the ATA. Thank you to each one of our panelists in the CEO Town Hall for your insight, insightful remarks. And Kojo, once again, thank you for uh, the excellent moderation. We'd also like to thank our many partners, um, the meetings, uh, Mean Business Africa, MPI, Cadazo Consulting, uh, based out of the US, Zambia Tourism, Mice Hub right here in Nairobi, and Mice uh, Zambia based in Lusaka. Many thanks to my colleague Mulemwa and all the Africa My Summit uh, regional representatives across the continent. Would like to thank your attendees uh, for making time to attend this event. And we sure do hope that today's dialogue has been enriching and valuable to each one of you. This recording will be available uh, and will be shared we have come uh, to a close of this special GMID Africa event, and Africa now looks forward uh, to the Africa Meetings Industry Day on September 9th. We will be following up to, uh, for each of the different commitments made on today's call, and we do hope that there will be tangible action that can be reported during the Africa Meetings Industry Day. Thank you all, keep safe, and God bless you. Bye-bye.